At this point, we've learned how electric motors turn using forces on moving charges within a magnetic field. A motor converts electrical energy into mechanical energy. We've also looked at an electric generator, and we realized that the moving rotor also induces an EMF, countering the change in flux. So, a generator converts mechanical energy into electrical energy. So motors and generators are generally designed the same way, with the same basic components. In fact, if you grab an electric motor and you spin it fast enough, you'll be able to power a light bulb, say. So, as an engineer, when you design a motor, how do you make it so that it's just a motor and not a generator? That is, you probably want your rotor to spin, but you're not looking for your device to generate electricity. You're not looking for a generator, you just want a motor. So how do you design that? Well, you can't. The change in flux and the resulting EMF is going to happen when the rotor starts spinning. Whether you want it to or not, your motor will act as a generator as well. It's simply how things work. A spinning motor will induce an EMF. And since this induced EMF will oppose the current flowing through your rotor, we call the induced EMF back EMF. And yes, it happens in every motor. So to truly understand how motors work, you need to understand back EMF. One cool result of back EMF in motors is that once motors are spinning, they use less current. The current to get a motor starting to spin is significantly higher than the current required to keep it spinning. Now, this may seem backwards to many, but now you know why this happens. Back EMF increases with the rate of spinning, just like a generator. And this back EMF opposes the input voltage, and the overall current must decrease. So, how does this impact motor use in real life? Here's a quick story. I used to design automation for production plants and they often had many large motors that were part of the production process. At the start of each shift, all of these motors would have to get started. So part of our automation involved not allowing the staff at the plant to start multiple motors at the same time. Before any motor could be started, it would have to detect that no other motor was still in the process of getting up to speed. We were trying to avoid a big spike in current. You see, the plant pays huge electrical bills, and a major part of these bills relates to the maximum current ever used in that plant. Since the motors take the most current during startup, you never want multiple motors starting at the same time. Once a motor is up to speed, the induced EMF causes the current to drop, and now you're ready to go through the startup process with the next motor. By doing this, we spread out the individual power spikes to avoid one major power spike. Let's consider an example. A motor has a resistance of 2 ohms, and it's connected to a 12 volt source, maybe a blower in your car. Anyways, at full speed, the motor has a back EMF of 8 volts. Determine the draw in the motor when starting, and then again when running at full speed. So, our first step, let's make a nice schematic for our motor. And during the startup process, the circuit could look like this. The motor is just replaced by a resistor. And you may ask, why is a motor shown as a resistor? Isn't the rotor in a motor just made up of a bunch of copper wire? True. That copper wire has a small amount of resistance for any given length. But remember, that a typical motor has piles of windings all wrapped up in that rotor. So the resistance does add up a bit. Our resulting startup circuit is super simple, so we can think back to Ohm's law. V equals IR, or arranging for the current for us, I equals V over R. And our voltage is 12 volts, and our resistance, 2 ohms. So 6 amps going through during startup. And that's a pretty big current. So now as the rotor gets spinning, the flux is changing and the back EMF is induced, 
And at full speed, we know that that back EMF is 8 volts, as we've been told. So how does this change things? Well, we're going to have to make a new schematic. The power source is still 12 volts, didn't do anything to the battery. The resistance of the windings is still 2 ohms, nothing's changed in the motor. So the only thing we need to add is the back EMF. And we can treat this back EMF as a little battery like this inside the motor. The induced EMF opposes the battery, so we have to put it in the opposite direction of our battery. So, this is our schematic for the motor at full speed. We have two batteries and a resistor. So, let's determine the current. Again, I equals V over R, but the voltage drop across the windings is now 12 volts minus the countering 8 volts, or 4 volts. So, I becomes 4 volts over 2 ohms, or 2 amps. And we can definitely see that this helps us by using a lot less power once this motor is running normally. Let's consider one more interesting side effect relating to an electric motor's back EMF. The end of a motor's life often results due to parts of the motor getting too hot and melting. Remember that current running through windings will generate heat. The greater the current, the greater the heat. With our new knowledge about back EMF, we can understand why motors typically won't die in this fashion when they're running at full speed. At full speed, the back EMF keeps the current relatively low and the heat doesn't build up as much. Most scenarios where a motor overheats involves an overload, that is, asking for too much torque from a given motor. It doesn't move fast enough. Most devices are designed with the expectation that their motor will spend most of its time at full speed. Most times the internal components aren't made to handle the starting current for more than a few seconds, that is, only during startup. If the current is at these startup levels for too long, then the heat starts to build up and things start to melt. A smart designer has to know how much time a particular motor is going to spend at various speeds. If low speeds are occasionally going to happen due to jams or heavy loads, well then the internal components must be designed to handle that higher current for a longer time. But if no jams or slow startups are expected for a given device, then a designer might decide to save some money and design with less robust wires and components, just being smart financially. So, understanding back EMF helps you both design devices and plan strategically to keep them running properly.